Hello everyone, this is Mark from Australia and this, I'm here for the second video that I said I would make regarding Stephen. Before I do start that, uh, thank you very much for the support I received from the first video I did earlier in the week. It's much appreciated and I hope there was some value there for, for those of you who saw it. Uh, it's evening, very late in the evening here on Friday night in Australia, so um, the background light and uh, is not as great as I would like it to be, but hopefully um, the message will be as clear as I want it to be. I wanted to talk about Stephen from a number of perspectives. Stephen's case is full of facts and it's a much more complex and more uh, a myriad of information that you need to get your head around. But one of the things for me that characterizes Stephen's case or the issues of Stephen's case is amidst all the information there are lots of unanswered questions. Things that for whatever reason that we don't have an answer to. And I'm going to come back to that issue as a general principle at the end of this video. But to illustrate this point, I've come up with 10 things, they're not in any order of priority or importance, that trouble me that we don't have the answers to. But the answers are out there, it's just that we don't have them. And this is a huge characteristic of Stephen's case, if you like the lack of information or the lack of answers to circumstances where the provision of those answers would tell us a lot. So let me give you um, uh, these 10 items. And by the way, I should say right from the outset, in, in raising these 10 issues as an example or as samples of my concern, you'll hear me mention the names of some other people that we're all familiar with. Just because I mention their names, I'm not stating anything at all about whether they're involved in this case from a criminal perspective, or I'm not saying anything about that. It's not a view that I'm going to take. All I'm just saying that these names that I'm mentioning are just part of the story, the story that still has many questions to be answered. I'll also need to look down on a page a piece of paper in front of me to prompt me in the questions I want to ask, so forgive me when I do that. Okay, so the first thing that bothers me was, oh by the way, I should also say that I've watched Making a Murderer seven times and I, every time I watch it I learn something more. Uh, so, and I'm a very avid watcher of um, some of the more committed uh, video presenters including Eric Jose and Sean Atwood and co. Um, and the and many of the other supporters, of course, who go to great detail of um, understanding the information in this case. But my first point has got to do with the time it took for Teresa to be reported missing. Now, Teresa was a lovely young girl from all accounts. She had a family that cared a lot about her. She had good friends that cared a lot about her, and she had a great job, she had work colleagues who cared a lot about her. She lived in a flat with another fellow, um, uh, Scott Blodorn, who she would, you would expect, see every day. And she, her next boyfriend, but I believe still a friend, Ryan Hillegas used to visit her regularly. In fact, had visited her the day before she, uh, well, the last day she was known to be still around. What I don't understand and what I want to have answered somewhere along the line is why did it take so long from a Monday afternoon or Monday evening through to a Thursday before this very gregarious girl is reported missing? It just doesn't make sense to me. If you live with someone, just imagine that, if you live with someone, and I'll just use Scott's relationship with Teresa as one example. If you live with someone and they hadn't come home one night and hadn't told you they weren't coming home, you might just, okay, maybe you would accept that. But the second night, the third night, it just doesn't make sense. And likewise with work colleagues and with family, although I can partially imagine family because Teresa's not living at home. 
but it's just an unusual set of circumstances between this gap of three days before she was reported missing. That's a piece of information that we need an answer for and goes to resolving this matter. Another issue of unanswered questions is the consider considerable conflict between times given by Brendan Dassey and Bobby Dassey and others, uh, the bus driver, about when Teresa was seen on the property on, on that Monday afternoon, the 31st. There are significant differences in the times that people have given testimony over when she was there. Now, they all can't be right. We need to understand why those conflicts exist. The third thing I'd want to mention was the issue of the location of the bones. Now, this is a tough topic to talk about because Teresa's death was horrific. Well, it would seem it was anyway. And the prosecution maintained that after she being murdered, that her body was placed on a fire outside um, or the back of Stephen Avery's garage and burnt. Well, but when the bones were found, they weren't found in a sort of a pattern that would normally be the pattern of human bones. They were found basically jumbled together in a pile. And we also know that there were bones, bones found in a burn barrel uh, near Stephen's property and also in a gravel pit or a quarry nearby. Now, that to me doesn't answer any questions except to tell us that it's pretty obvious that those bones didn't start at Stephen's property. They came from somewhere else and were put there. We need to know the answer for sure about that money. Now, none of that's new evidence, of course. It was argued in trial and it's been argued about many times since. But it's still an unresolved question. Where, where was Teresa killed? Where was her body cremated, if I can call it that? And when did the bones find their way back to Stephen's property and by whom? It's always concerned me when I listen to Ryan Hillegas's testimony at Stephen's trial about his apparent lack of memory. We do know, and he testified to the fact that he saw Teresa on the Sunday, that's the 30th of October, the day before we think is uh, Teresa's last known day. But when under cross-examination by the defence, Ryan couldn't remember whether he had saw, where, sorry, whether he had seen her in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening, whether it was daylight outside or whether it was darkness. That seems also a remarkable issue. I don't know that it goes quite to the heart of the factual side, but it seems odd that a person wouldn't remember an event like that, given the seriousness. You know, two or three days later after that, he's in, he's leading a search party these issues would be starting to be, you know, cemented in his brain. So, but at trial, he can't remember. The jury. The jury also concerned me from this point of view. After Stephen's trial was over, which I think ran for five or six weeks, something like that anyway, the jury retired and as is common with juries, they at first sit around and say, well, what do you think? What would be your verdict based on what you've just heard? And that initial question was answered by seven of the 12 jurors that Stephen was not guilty. I think two said he was guilty, could be three, and the remainder were unsure. But by the time two or three days had passed, all jurors had voted that he was guilty. So after watching the trial evidence and, and absorbing it and contemplating it over five or six weeks and coming to the view that, or seven of them came to the view that he was not guilty, within a couple of days or a few days, they all said he was guilty. It makes you wonder, why did those jurors change their mind in the jury room after the trial was over? And what happened in that jury room that caused them to change their mind? That's a lot of change from seven, or if you like, three not guilty, oh, sorry, three guilty to 12 guilty. 
That's a big change. That's another unanswered question for me. I was also very concerned. The issue of the involvement of Lieutenant Link and um, Sergeant Colburn in the investigation who are police officers um, associated with Manitowoc who were not supposed to be involved in the investigation at all. And we know they were, and we know they were early on. But not only did we know they were early on, which was should not have happened, they were also involved later on. And you have to ask why. But not so much that, because that question has been asked before. But why hasn't any police officer, at least none that I've heard, spoken up about the improper conduct of those two persons in particular, maybe others, but those in particular, why has no one spoken up about that? It just seems remarkable. Well, maybe not remarkable if they've got something to hide, but that's the point. There's a piece of information here that we need to know that we don't know. And there's a lot of those examples in this case. Number seven, you might recall during the trial there was much to do about the fact that um, Teresa's phone uh, was um, hacked, for want of a better term, by Ryan and to see whether there were messages on the phone. And there was much evidence given in the court from experts from the Singular Wireless Company stating many things about many aspects of the use of that phone. But it came to the conclusion that in order for messages to go through to Teresa's phone in the days after her disappearance, that someone must have deleted pre-existing messages on her phone after she disappeared. Now, Judge Willis, who officiated over the case, put that question, in a sense, directly to Ken Kratz, the prosecutor, and said, um, Mr. Kratz, does the prosecution know if any of those messages were deleted? It's a fairly simple question. The answer is either yes or no. The problem is that Mr. Kratz didn't answer the question. And in fact, he was very, very much stumbling with it and blubbering blah, 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 blah about it, um, which seemed extremely odd to me. Well, perhaps it's not odd because... If he had said yes, that would be a huge admission from him in terms of his professional conduct and the, and the impact it would have on the case if he admitted that there were messages, he, that, that he knew that messages were deleted. But if he answered no, and he knew that no to be incorrect, then he personally would uh, run with a risk of contempt of court and other professional misconduct charges. So the safe option to him was not to answer the question. Because if he was to say no and genuinely didn't know, why wouldn't you say no? Worse than that though, Judge Willis didn't press him on the question. He sort of, mm ha, mm ha, well, I don't quite see the relevance of this at this time. Now, every witness in that trial is subject to proper and appropriate um, questions from both the prosecution and defence. But when asked a very yes, simple yes-no question, Mr Kratz deliberately and knowingly avoided answering yes or no. Why did he do that? Another big unanswered question for me. In more recent weeks, or perhaps month, um, Kathleen Zellner... Uh, took an affidavit from Brian Dassey, this is the older brother of Brendan and Bobby, and in that affidavit, Brian states that around the time of um, Teresa's disappearance, that Bobby, contrary to his testimony in court, that Bobby had actually told him at the time that Teresa had left the property. So why is that difference? Why has Brian said that Bobby left the property, sorry, that Teresa left the property, when Bobby said uh, he didn't see her leave the property. In fact, Bobby's testimony would 
imply that Teresa walked to Stephen's trailer. Another gap in the information story. Mr. Zipper, who was an, an intended uh, person on Teresa's calendar. Now, when the investigations took place after, in regard to this matter, the CD or the recording device in his answering machine at home was missing. No one could find it. What happened to that? Why would that suddenly be missing? Another piece of information, the answer to which would help discover the truth. And that's all we're after here, is the discovery of the truth. And Judge Willis himself. You know, I found it remarkable at the summing up, when Stephen was convicted, of course, and at his sentencing, sentencing hearing, um, Judge Willis made the comment, or words to this effect, that Stephen was the worst person ever to step foot in his court, or in the court. And he also made this remarkable comment that said something like, what troubles me most about you, Mr Avery, is that as you've got older, your crimes have become more severe and worse. Now, that, if you read that, or you listen to that, and you think about it, it would imply that Stephen was a career criminal. Now let's just think about that for a moment, a career criminal. For the 20 years prior to this particular court case, two of them, Stephen, had been free without any criminal activity or any charges ever laid against him. In 18 years he, before that, he was in prison on wrongful conviction charges. Okay, before that even, Stephen had got up to some inappropriate things when he was uh, in his early 20s, late teens, early 20s, including uh, sealing some sandwiches and beer from a pub or a package store or something. And also the totally inexcusable incident with the cat and the fire and his mates. Well, that's just horrific and he should have been punished for that and he was. And of course, he, uh, around that similar time, he ran his cousin, I think it was, um, off the road, Sandra, uh, off the road because in Stephen's opinion she was spreading you know, malicious rumours about him around town. So he ran her off the road with a car and got out and threatened her with an unloaded rifle. Now, just forget the facts around all that. That's just unacceptable to that behaviour. And Stephen, um, that, you know, that it's not the crime of the century, but it's certainly unacceptable. But anything that Stephen actually did wrong in his time, he took the punishment and served whatever penalty was dished out to him. But Judge Willis's comments would suggest that Stephen is this notorious criminal that you would think had offended year on year on year and his crimes have got worse and worse. Now, why did he take that view? Why was he trying to make Stephen out as this just, you know, horrific type of person? To me, that's another big unanswered question about the judicial process that wrapped around this trial. And finally, I just wanted to talk to you before I come to another matter about Stephen's, a bit like with Brendan, about Stephen's attitude and his behaviour. Think about when Stephen was interviewed by local media, I think it was on the Thursday here, well, you might remember in the documentary and in other presentations, the TV station came out and interviewed him standing next to the car that was the subject of the sale. It was in the night and... He was asked what he knew, what happened on the day, and Stephen just gives fairly straightforward, un, well, nonchalant type answers about, yes, she came out, um, she took some photos, um, she gave me a copy of the magazine, and then she left. There's nothing about his behaviour that was anything other than just normal. He was very free with giving information, he didn't avoid speaking to the press. You know, with the benefit of hindsight, he's all, you know, if he committed this crime that allegedly happened in the afternoon of the 31st and he went with his younger nephew, Brendan, and he was allegedly involved in this crime, and probably based on any timeline that the prosecution would say was probably around, you know, 
4 or 5 o'clock, something like that. And then later on, they put the body on the fire and burnt it. You know? And, and there's a rec recording of a telephone conversation at 9 o'clock that same night between Jody, then Stephen's girlfriend, who was presently serving some time in the local county jail, I think, for traffic offences. And she and Stephen were a loving couple and she was speaking to him that night about personal stuff. Nothing in Stephen's conversation or style or manner or anything would indicate he's just committed this horrific murder. Um, just think about it. If that was in fact what had happened, that is that these crimes did happen and at the hands of Stephen, do you think that conversation might have sounded a little bit different with Jody that night? And then just to go to his trial, or at the end of his trial, well, you know, when the, when the jury brought down their verdict and that was read out by Judge Willis, just watch Stephen's reaction. It wasn't a reaction of guilt. It was a reaction of disbelief. A disbelief that yet again he's been convicted of a crime that he hasn't had anything to do with. You only have to take a look at the way he physically behaves to realise this is a man going through a lot of pain again. And then when it came to sentencing and Stephen had the right to say something, just think about and go back and listen to that, what Stephen had to say. What did he say? Well, again, words of this effect. He said he's sorry for all the pain, both to the Hallbachs and his family and to the community. He said he didn't commit the crime and that he would have to try to prove that like he did before. And that's all he had, he had to say and he thanked the judge. That's not the behaviour of a criminal. That's the behaviour of a, a man who is innocent and reconciling himself, how is he going to, in the future, free himself from this horrific sentence. But nothing about his demeanour was angry, was vindictive, was trying to blame other people. Very thoughtful response to the court. Um, and that's something that I think we all should pay a lot of attention to. So anyway, the, the purposes of mentioning these things, as I said at the beginning, was there are lots of missing pieces of information. But importantly about these missing pieces of information, there are people out there who know the answers to that. And for whatever their reason is, they haven't come forward, either they haven't remembered or they're afraid to come forward, or they just, well, they just haven't. And if they had come forward and they had um, you know, brought forward this information, we might be talking about a very different set of circumstances. Now these people could be just citizens in the town. They might be police officers, both existing and retired. They might be staff in the clerk's, or the clerk's office of the courthouse, both existing and retired, who've heard things, who know of things. They might be jurors who know of things. These are all important things. There's a moral obligation on all of us to be truthful in this situation, not just, if you like, to free Stephen, but also the Hallbachs deserve to know the truth in this matter. And what they've got so far is clearly not the truth. Worse than that, we have, I would say, and many others would say, we have the real killer still out there, or killers, if there's more than one. And we have an, uh, an attitude inside the, the justice system, at least at some level, that thinks it's okay to behave like this. That Stephen Avery is, you know, an expendable person in the pursuit of whatever they think is appropriate. You know, I forget the name of the law enforcement officer that gave that interview and and said something to the effect, well, if we really wanted to uh, frame Stephen Avery, it would have been easier to, you know, to have him killed. That's in the effect. I mean, just think about that. 
That's what a law enforcement officer says. Okay, so here's the, the wrap up of this part of it. The missing pieces of information troubled me greatly. So I, me, Mark, are putting $10,000 on the table. I'm putting it on the table to offer some incentive and some reaction to see whether there are people out there who are prepared to come forward. And I'm putting 10 lots of $1,000 on the table. So for the first 10 pieces of information that can come forward over the next three months to the end of March, and where that information can ind independently pro be proven to be both new and valid to the, the search of truth, and uh, can be either verified through independent persons or by affidavits that are given, then if that happens, then the persons who do that will receive $1,000 from me. Now, you mightn't think $1,000 is a particularly huge incentive, and you know what? It mightn't be. But it's meant to prick the conscience and say, we have a duty to be honest here. And I'm hoping that in doing this, this will make people realise how people like myself, and to some degree I reflect the emotion and the intent of the supporters of the truth here, that we're not playing games or just thinking about these things willy-nilly, it's something that we really believe in. Now, if only five people come forward and not ten, well, they'll get $2,000 each. And if only one person came through with the appropriate valid piece of information, they'll get the whole $10,000. It's on the table. Now, the people who do come forward with this information, if they do, as I said, it's open for the next three months, that information will be passed on to the lawyers, who deal with it independently, with appropriate privacy, and do the appropriate independent checks of the validity of that information. It won't be something that I'll be personally involved in. This is an appropriate uh, action for the lawyers. So it's out there, and I hope it has, in some small way, an ability to tease out some of the missing information that would go a long way towards discovering the truth in this matter and that's what any of us and all of us want. Before signing off I wanted to mention something about Alan and Dolores Avery, Stephen's parents. Uh, one can't imagine as parents what you've gone through in the last 30 years. In fact a longer period than that but for 30 years, your son Stephen has been in jail for crimes he hasn't committed. You know, we could think about that in terms of being parent, and I'm a parent, you think about that, but you can't imagine that pain that must be going through that family, and particularly his mum and dad. But you know what? Their commitment to their son is just so special, so, so special. They've always believed in him. They've conducted themselves gracefully. Um, they've always um, shown such a wonderful um, ability to hold together as a family and work hard. I think of those Dolores saying in one part of the documentary how she photocopied all these documents and put them all in a row and sent them off to, you know, 60 minutes and what have you. I mean, that's a huge task for anyone, let alone for a mum um, trying to do this on her own, uh, or obviously with family around, but trying to do those things. They are just the most remarkable parents that I've ever come across. Just remarkable. Yet, you know, some would say, you, know, you just remember that horrific email that um, Michael O'Kelly wrote on behalf of Chen, or to Ken uh, Kaczynski, Len Kaczynski, sorry, um, talking about the Avery family and the horrific things and gross things that he said about that family. Mrs. And Mrs. Mr. and Mrs. Avery, you're amazing people and you, we're all extremely proud of you, extremely proud of you. And, you know, you're just great 
mum and dad. And um, I know Stephen feels very proud to be your son. You know, I think out there on the salvage yard with all those cars and all those rusty cars, I think some of those rusty cars in my little mind produces this iron dust in the air. And in that iron dust in the air, you breathe in. And that iron makes you as strong as steel. You're just a remarkable couple. And when this story is over, and it will be over, um, um, much of Stephen's strength and his ability to hold on has come through not only your DNA, but your unwavering love for him and the search for the truth. So thank you for who you are. And um, I wish you a very Merry Christmas. I know it's tough not having him. You've, had, you've not had Stephen with you for 30 Christmases. And hopefully this year is the last time that that's true. Anyway, all, my, all the best to all the supporters and I uh, look forward to um, working with you and all doing our best in 2018. Bye.